Hello, everyone. Everyone I cannot see but know uh, is actually out there. Uh, welcome. I'm Nellie Oliansis. I'm chair of the Department of Classics at UC Berkeley. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the first lecture in this year's Sather Lecture Series. Usually the Sather Lectures are presented by the current year's Sather Professor, a distinguished scholar who joins our community here in Berkeley for an entire semester. And the lectures form a coherent set of presentations organized around a single theme or developing a single argument to be published subsequently as a book by the University of California Press. This year, of course, and perforce, we are doing things a little differently. And under the circumstances, I believe our magnificent patron, Jane K. Sather, who endowed the Sather professorship over 100 years ago, would surely approve. What we have done is to invite back four former Sather professors, each a specialist in a very different branch of this capacious discipline we call classics, to deliver a single lecture on a topic of their choice. And I have to say that even though each of them is returning to us only virtually and only for one morning, it's morning here in California at any rate, it gives me real joy to be able to welcome them back. It seems especially fitting that the series is being kicked off by Francois Lissarag, who was our Sather professor in 2014 when we celebrated the lectureship's 100th anniversary. The beautiful poster that was designed by David Lance Goins for the occasion coincidentally and felicitously featured a detail from the Francois vase, and some of you uh, know this poster well. Professor Lissarag is one of the world's leading scholars of ancient Greek iconography and a scintillating interpreter of Attic vase painting in particular. A hugely influential scholar and also a much sought after and indeed much loved interlocutor, Professor Lissarag has held visiting positions and lectureships at a vast array of institutions, including the universities of Pisa, Lausanne, Bern, Siena, Oxford, Michigan, and the Getty Villa, to name just a few, as well as, of course, and most significantly, UC Berkeley. His lecture today is entitled Art and Allusion, Image Construction and Attic Vase Painting. Without further ado, let me turn the screen over to Francois Lissarag. There we go. Yeah, and now yeah. I will move to full screen so you, you won't see me, which is not, not very important. But before I move to the full screen, I want to thank you all. I mean, Nelly in the classics department and all the friends in Berkeley. And I see friends from uh, other places like Daffrey, which I'm very glad to see virtually or not see, but at least be in contact with. So, um, I was a bit embarrassed when I was asked to give this not real postscriptum lecture, but to yeah bring in something for the for these lectures. And I, I I'm interested in the way pictures work, how they are built, and what are the rules uh, which are involved when we perceive uh, these images. I have slightly modified my title. It's not Attic vase painting, but Greek vase painting because I have some example from Corinth and Laconian iconography, but I will really focus on Attic vase painting. And of course the title Art and Allusion is in turn an allusion to Gombrich, very famous book, Art and Illusion, uh, which was a landmark and is still a very important book for all of us, uh, if we want to understand how pictorial representation works. And it's the subtitle, study in the psychology of pictorial representation says very well what he's embracing and, and trying to make how the brain is at work when we look at pictures. My aim today is very much more modest and in one hour of course I cannot um, even think about uh, uh, comparing to what Gombrich is doing but what I'm interested is reflecting on the cognitive mechanism at work when, when we look at a very specific kind of representation that appear on Greek painted vases. Uh, we are very familiar with vases, uh, but these painted pots uh, are very strange objects, in fact, and uh, very unusual and very difficult to perceive and to understand. And I'd like to start with this painting by Edouard Villard because I think it captures very well our puzzling confrontation with Greek vases 
in the modern contemporary experience. The painting is from 1922 and shows at one angle of one room in the Louvre, the so-called Clarac uh, room. And as you see, we have lots of cases, glasses, transparency, even the shelves are glass. So there are lots of surfaces which are through which we can look in and see. And in the background here, we have a woman using a guide and in front of the case, looking at the objects and probably reading Potier's recent guide at that time. Also two, two persons, a man and a woman, just next to him, looking up in front of the big case, which is also uh, not hiding, but uh, between us and the woman in the background. And they all are looking at these vases, trying to see what's on them and understand what's going on and having an, uh, also an aesthetic experience. They are not archaeologists, we don't know. And of course, we don't know what they have in mind and how it works in their mind. And I'm not going to try to do that. What I'm very fascinated with that painting is the way in a very typical way of uh, Villard, fragmenting the space, using glasses, windows. We have a view on the other side of the Seine and the, the Seine is just behind here. So it's all about looking, considering and, and having that relationship with vases. But of course the vases are in cases. No one can touch them, no one can even handle them. So the experience is purely visual. And in that painting, we have several parts here, there and there, which are of course in the Louvre and which I briefly show you not to discuss them, but to insist on the fact that these are objects, complex objects with round shapes, several faces, I mean, the neck and the belly and a, and a black figure freeze, or this one has three sides and a top um, zone. And this one, which is used to, to, to spin the wool, is, has two pictures, one we see and the other one we don't see yet. And also a plastic figure of a woman. So very complex uh, objects. And my interest is in trying to understand how things are connected and linked together on each of these objects. So I've decided to start with a very minimalist image, uh, which I thought was very simple at the beginning. It's just a, a man on a bed, a lyre and a stool on the Corinthian plates. And I, I, I quickly realized that even that one is not so simple because this man here is sometimes described as a man on his, on his bed. And uh, one book even says a dead poet, uh, which I don't think it is because the eyes are open. Uh, there is music here. Uh, I thought at the beginning it was a symposium, but it's a monoposiast. And so one figure, the liar shows that he has to do with music. This is why I tend to think we are at the symposium. And the stool here shows that someone had to climb up to the bed using this, so he's not dead. And this is not a funerary ritual like here. Uh, he's a living figure. And I think he's one at the symposium, but we don't have any drinking or vase or table. And he's monoposiast more than symposiast. But I think, this object was interesting for my purpose because it very clearly shows how things are displaced in the picture in a, in a paratactic way. There is no syntax here. I mean, the lyre is here as an object in the field. The man is on the bed, but there is no connection with other people. And he's limited by the frame, the circle, and, and the object itself is in, isolation. And this is what I want to explore. The way the field, the frame, and the medium. And I will start with objects in the field and what is that field. We could describe this surface here in two different ways. On the one hand, it is the 
it is the surface of the plate. And as pottery, it is part of the clay plate on which the picture is traced. But of course, that same round and surface of the plate is also the background and the field of the picture. So we can read this or perceive this surface in two ways, as part of the, the plate, as a, a, a clay object, or as part of the image as someone, something linking together the elements of the picture. And uh, painters have played very much with the, these two versions, part of the, the ground of the pot or part of the image itself. And this is true from the beginning. I take, looking at the field, I take a very early a crater in New York showing um, the protesis. And as you see, nothing of the field is left empty. Uh, not only in the general structure of the vase with all these meanders and uh, ornaments that create the rhythm, but also in the picture itself, because the dead body is surrounded by a lamenting figure, but between each figure, there are chevron and dots and elements that fill the field of the picture itself. And the same on the other side, there is no representation at the top level, but ornaments, circles and meanders. So there is a, a very strong um, work about filling everything on the, on the surface of the pot. And this is true from early on, I mean, in geometric times, but also in the, in the Orientalist, uh, uh, Orientalist period and in Corinthian vase painting. Yeah, the vase itself is structured in several rows, but the field is filled with rosettes, which have nothing realistic and are just really filling every element of the surface. And that goes to a very high level. I mean, if we take these small arribalas with a, a lion attacking a, a deer and another panther here, you can notice that the whole field is full of rosettes. Nothing is left without anything. And interestingly, we have just a head of a warrior with his helmets above the panther here. So this kind of will of putting together as much as possible elements of um, decoration and description. Later in time, we see, uh, for example, here on this um, <clears throat> pixis in, in Berlin, uh, a series of so-called padded dancers, so comasts dancing, and the field is also full of rosettes. And that goes up to this a crater from which uh, the comest is dipping and taking wine. And then the rest of the picture is a kind of chorus of women in a very different, almost ritual presentation. So there's big contrast between men dancing agitated and these uh, women on the other side. But my point is to stress two elements here. Next to the crater, we have uh, a lecanus, a, a vase in the field, but also the position of the object is exactly the same as the rosette. But that object is part of the vessel. I mean, crater, oinokoi, uh, and the vase to drink. This is a system uh, in terms of function and technology of drinking. But also here, the the lichen is the cup is symmetrical or is at the same level as the rosette. So on one side, we have the surface of the pot, which is decorated with rosette. And here we have the picture which integrates one um, vase for drinking in, in image. And these objects in the field are very interesting and very typical of Corinthian imagery. Here we have on this crater with a big symposium, uh, uh, four beds with four couples of men and women on the beds and tables. And here we are very clearly in the symposium. But as you see on the top, 
we have objects, a lyre, a helmet, a lyre, helmet, cuirass, a lyre, and, and a vase. And again, these objects are feeling uh, in the background. But one interesting detail is this, this lyre here is held by the man on the bed. So here we have a lyre, which is seen and represented as a, an actual object at the same level as the, the fialai or the object they use in the symposium. Whereas the rest of the objects are just kind of hanging in the background and filling and qualifying the, the, the man here as a warrior, of course, and the woman as maybe a singer or the man as a singer as it is here. Whereas on the lower part, we have still these rosettes filling the field. So the field can be decorated with purely ornamental objects, echoing in turn the ornamental elements of the beds, or as utilitarian objects active in the image. And this is one aspect I want to look at closely. The same <coughs> elements uh, appear in the early Attic vase painting when it is still very close to Corinthian ways of doing. And so these lions are, the field here is, is, is filled with rosettes. And here these two confronted lions are organized around an ornament, which is very typical of the end of the orientalizing style and the early Attic black figure style. But speaking of objects in the field, if we have a look at the vase this woman was looking at, and we know see from both sides here, on one side we have this woman in, in the house with baskets full of wool and working wool and spinning. And in the field we have one alabastron hanging and a basket. So these are the objects which are expected around this woman. On the other side, we have Amazon, so women warrior helmeted with shields and the shield is hanging on the field and passing from the background of the picture into the hands of the warriors and becoming an actually used object. Interestingly, the, the top of the tip of the, what we call an epinetron, this object which is to be placed on the knee of the woman and covers the, the tight and the knee is on a dawn with a, a plastic terracotta head of a woman. So we have the woman at the end, which is what we can see here, echoing the, the head of the woman of, of, in the modern world. But just to stay at the level of the fifth century object, on one side we have women at home and on the other side women fighting. So kind of sort of possible daily representation and a mythical vision of women. And the objects are contrasting perfume and work and the shield and, and, and the battle. Following this line of objects in the field, I would like to draw your attention on the construction of this image of women going to the fountain. And the fountain is here with this column, uh, the pediment and the, the water spouts, which is one lion spouting in the hydria seen in profile and one panther seen in frontal face spouting water in the hydria. Now, Later in time, we have a very simplified image of the same uh, panther head here, which is now we understand the same as the one here, and the same because this woman is bending over in Hydria. So here, the, the pan panther, if it's him, uh, has reduced the description to the minimum. One panther, one vase, and this is a fountain and the woman going to the fountain. And so you see how the elements of the pictures are not connected by a continuous construction, uh, which gives all the details and as descriptive as it is in the Antimonist painter. Uh, 
vast images can be very minimalist. And one part, one spout is enough to, de to describe the old. So we are in something like, um, yeah, illusion more than description. And uh, these elements are enough when you have the knowledge of the culture to understand what's going on here. And this vase is playing the same kind of trick. I mean, it's a cap uh, in Oxford showing a procession with an Olus player standing in front of, by an altar in front of an urn with a pinax, so a painted black, an offering votive. And the, the object here in the field is part of the structure of the sanctuary the painter is alluding to. Now, on the other side of the same pot, we have, we are outside because there is a tree and two a young person standing in front of a seated bearded man. And the objects in the field are one writing case and a cross, which I think has to do with musical instrument. It's open to discussion, but for the moment I place it in, on the side of musical education. So these two objects are not describing the place, the actual place. They are giving connotations. They are um, alluding to what these young men can do and learn music and learn writing and recitation. So on that cup, on one side, the pinax can be in a more realistic way thought of being hanging in the sanctuary. And these two objects here in the field are not describing what is actually going on, but what these young men can be connected with, mm -hmm. writing, singing, and music. And the same here, I mean, Doris, uh, which I will show you a few vases, is, is very fan of objects in the field. And on that cup, which shows Dionysus and Heracles on the inside, and young courtship scenes and discussion between couples of men, the whole field is filled with the same elements we have by the handle. So the ornaments, the decoration, the ornamental decoration, which is the frame of the picture is also inserted into the picture itself to add of beauty of this people. And you don't see it in the photograph here, but this gesture and, and this one here also, uh, if you look closely, they, they handle uh, actual flowers in the picture. So the beauty is built with these elements into the image. Very often in Doris, we have sympotic scenes like this one, like the one we saw on the Corinthian crater a bit earlier, with this young pies holding Oinokoi to serve and to fill the cups that the drinkers are holding. But at the same time, in the field, we have hanging cups and Oinokoi alternating. And so the objects handled in use and the objects hanging as a sign, as an element, which is repeating in more abstract uh, um, in a more abstract way, what is shown here in use. But sometimes Doris does something slightly different. Here we have a, a school scene with the pedagogos and, and the teacher with the, the scroll and the text, Moisa Moi and Fiskamandron. So showing and, and having a young boy rec reciting some epic fragment and this one learning to play music. And the objects are used as actual uh, handled object, but also hanging in the field, two lyres and uh, a flute case and a basket to carry things to school, but also cups here and there, which have nothing to do at school. They are not drinking in the school, but the objects here are opening a reference, not internal to the picture we are looking at, but external to the space which we saw before. I mean, these young men are learning to be able to recite when they are in the symposium. So objects in the field 
sometimes are self-reflexive and sometimes are opening to another dimension. And the connections are made to other spaces, other activities. The same here, one generation later, on that cap, we have a horseman and a young man assisting to the preparation for the horseman. But in the field, we have a writing case, which has to do with school and teaching and learning. It can also have to do with the documasia and the registration of horses. So this sign here um, is, sorry, this sign is, referring to two possibilities, the education of the young man before reaching the stage of being horseman, or the activity of a, a city doing the ex examination of the horses. On the other side of the cab, we see a hook for a helmet, but it's not used here, and also a shield hanging in the field. That is war and warriors. And these young men are not arming, they are discussing with their, maybe the teacher. So the objects in the field here are not repeating what the show, image shows, but hinting at another space and another form of activity. Same thing here. I'm not discussing the inside, which is a sanctuary and a woman paying homage to an home, but I'm looking at what we have outside and we have um, an aribalus, a strigil and a sponge. So this is athletic activity. And if writing case, and this is education, which goes with this cross, which I take to be connected with music. So uh, education uh, and athletics. And on the other side of the cup, halters, sandals, which is athletics, and then a shield, which is war, and then the cross, which is music. So what the pictures show is adult and young men, or young men among themselves discussing. And what the background shows are elements of activities which covers war, education, and athletics, which is almost programmatic for um, um, a young Athenian citizen. So these objects in the field and the way they are connected with figure can be, can vary. They can be redundant or not. Here, for example, you have a woman by the basket of woodworking, preparing a libation with an oinokoi uh, and a fiale, but on the shoulder and almost disconnected from the figure, we have a mirror, a sacos and crotalite. So the beauty of the woman and that her musical activity. And so the woman here is qualified in different ways by the basket as a working woman, by the object as a ritual movement, as a woman involved in the ritual activity and on the shoulder, where, which is the place usually of palmets and ornaments. What is the ornament by music and beauty of the woman? So these objects in the field are sometimes actually used by the figure. And here we have on a wide ground lake it has, uh, where many objects are in the field, but here they are handled. The visiting woman brings fruit and holds a lake ethos as an offering to the tomb in front of the visible image of the deceased, which is in actual life invisible but holding a lyre and described as um, a very well-educated young boy. So these are objects as handled. Now on this lake ethos uh, with a very complex uh, stele, we have many objects there. Uh, two little statues describing this dead person as a, an athlete. But also, so in front of the visiting man and the visited dead invisible figure, we also have objects in the field, which are a lyre and a disc. So the 
these two objects are in partly repeating the athletic dimension of what is on the, the steel itself, but also partly, sorry, qualifying the young boy as an educated uh, young man who received the musical education of all the Greek. Interestingly, the image here in silhouette shows two boxing and spectator. So again, the athletic dimension. So the athletic dimension is, is very heavily stressed here by the two statues on the tomb and the pictures on the, on the um, pediment and on the disc, but also music is there. And the lyre can by itself be an independent object as on this uh, stamnos, where the, which is completely black, except for the image of a barbiton. And here the object becomes just a sign and it opens to many other contexts, which I've shown you, education, the symposium, the practice of singing and, 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 uh, and playing music at the symposium. So as you see, the field of the image can be filled with objects that are adding uh, elements to the image or opening to other dimensions. Now I'd like to come to the frame. These images on the pots are framed by lines and I should have a look at that now. From the beginning, Buzz painters have limited the image by a frame, a kind of window, as you see it, as you see here. It's not always the case, and sometimes the frame is not a straight line like a border. Here we have a border and a window, and here we have an image which is limited by ornaments which are. Uh, organized with the handle. So it can be a very strict frame or a, a zone which is reserved for the picture. But once we have this frame, very often there is more outside. I mean, the frame is not something that gives you everything, but uh, as in the Leagros, Leagros group, sorry, uh, the on the right here, you see you, you only have a, a bit of the, the chariots. If we look more closely, you see the horses are cut by the wind. And the tomb of Patroclus is also cut by the, the, the frame. And we have Hector, of course, we, we know this image of uh, uh, Achilles um, traging the body of Hector. And the parents in Troy are also limited by the frame. I mean, Priam and uh, Hecabe, which are lamenting and gesturing at a distance, uh, seeing how Hector's body, you see the hands of Hector are cut by the frame. So in that option by the Agros group, they tend to densify the image and to leave for the outside even more than what they really show uh, actually in the picture. And that idea of the frame limiting the image is also uh, at work uh, in red figure. Here, for example, Eutymides is, is showing us three revelers, three commasts. On another vase, we see an arming of uh, Hector between Priam and Hecabe, but interestingly, as you see, the helmet exceeds the, the, the dimension which is reserved to, to the picture. And he has very carefully stopped the ornament to leave space for the crest and the helmet itself. And there are many ways of uh, handling this problem. Uh, one interesting option has been to uh, invented by the Berlin painter and his contemporaries was to uh, give up with the window. Uh, they only keep one ground line and here you have Hermes and the Silenus. 
on the kind of black background. And sometimes the Berlin painter is even more radical. There is no ground line here, no frame, no ornament. And the picture is directly on the pot itself. And the pot is the frame, uh, the same on the other side. So what the Berlin painter does here, being very minimalist, is to get away from the uh, earlier uh, system of ornaments, frames, and lotus, and, and so on, and to use the pot as a kind of frame or case where on, on which the singer appears here. And you have to turn the other side to understand the full picture and to make that connection between the singer in the competition and the, the judge uh, appreciating the, the, the music. The same here on this fragmentary Panathinaik Amphora in, in Munich. On one side, we, uh, we have the goggle running. And on the other side, I mean, this is the better picture of the detail of that terrifying face. And on the other side, we have Perseus running after her with a, with a sickle to cut the head of the Gorgon. So it's always, I mean, each side is only one part of the story. And we need in our books or in, as I do here in, the lecture, in this lecture, have to put the two pictures together to make it work fully. But the way it works in people's mind, ancient people's mind, is that when they see the Gorgon or when they see Perseus, they see one part of the story that they are able in their mind to make the full story work. And another problem about the frame is the, the problem of the, the, the circle. Well, the part is the background of the representation. In early times, in geometric times, the, the, the full surface is uh, used by the painter. And they have ornament in the tondo, and here uh, is a wire and a row of women and men together in a kind of uh, chorus dancing or chorus moving around and, and tripods outside probably the prize for that competition. Now, interestingly, I mean, I, I want to show you this fascinating image which combines a tondo and a zone. It's a fiale. So what seems to you to be a circle actually is in relief. It's, uh, and the scale is different. I mean, here you have some big commasts dancing and the ground line is all here around them. But in the middle, you have a, a different scale and the ground line is no, uh, not on the top, but on, on, on the, on, Oh, sorry. The ground line here for the comest is in the central part, where the ground line for the ladies here is at the top of them. So this area is the ground line booth for these two, but they are oriented differently. And what the painter is doing here is to play a way of shifting from the female zone which is very ritual. You have a nullus player, and then they are in a, in a procession, like a chorus, holding each other's hand, uh, which makes that this woman here has three hands, two for the aulus and one for his uh, companion. But they are very uh, ritually and formally well-organized, whereas these are very agitated upside down. I mean, for this one, the ground light is here on the top. And this one has a very obscene position. So the, the image plays and the frame given to the zone and the tondo plays with this different fem male, female, agitated and, and ritualized. In Attic Vas painting, the painters have taken very early a very important decision is not to paint the whole uh, inside of the cup, 
So to isolate the tondo and to use one figure here, sometimes ornament as you see here, and to be very minimalist and to leave the rest in black. Laconian glass painting has a very different solution. Uh, they use a much bigger part of the inside. And here, the, the, the circle of the tondo is a kind of window which leaves much more outside what you see. For example, the, the main image is two warriors carrying a dead body. But this here, you have another dead body with a head and the rest is missing. And here you have the legs of another group, which is also missing. So you have a kind of frieze of which the, the tondo is isolating one segment. And they also have to create a ground line because otherwise it, it, it wouldn't fit with the circle. And the, the segment is filled with two cocks fighting, which echo the aggressivity of the warriors and the war. Laconian vase painting has also used the old solution of the zone. And here we have a symposium with a, a crater and servants and uh, drinkers uh, holding vases and cups, but also diamonds, which are difficult and I'm not going to discuss here now. Uh, and also objects in the field like uh, vases or uh, writer, sorry, and, and ringing vessels. And the, the inside is the, the central part. The, the tondo is reserved for a very complex palmet. So reverting the logic we've seen in attic glass painting. But attic cups very, very often have only one organella, not even a figure, but just the head, uh, which we've seen of Medusa, uh, which was cut by Perseus. And the head now becomes a, an emblem in the tondo, whereas the outside can be much more complex. And this emblem sometimes is again filled like in the Laconian cup and earlier cups by a symposium. So interestingly, now we have drinkers in a zone surrounded by wine, uh, a vine which is growing up at the level of the handles and feeling a kind of ornamental series of grapes as the ornament we have here on the Laconian cup are now a real vine and the space inside the cup is displaying a group of seven or six drinkers inside the cup, whereas in the real world outside the cup, you have also drinkers. So between the actual company of the drinkers and the inside of the cup, you have the vase itself. And again, the, the, the painter is, is playing with the idea of shifting from the outside world, which is reproducing inside the cup uh, for, the paint, for the drinker to, to look at it. And there are more complexities and more possibilities in that cup in London, which Daphne knows quite well, and which is one of my favorite caps. Uh, we are shifting from black figure to red figure, and also from the zone to the tondo, and also from the boats, which are rowing on that sea, which can be, uh, when the cup is filled full of wine, uh, used as a, an actual sea on which the boats are floating. And in the tondo, in the red figure, the painter has shifted to red figure with this man holding a, an amphora full of wine, of course. And these boats are for war, not for, for markets. But of course they, they play and, and uh, what we have under our eyes as drinkers is a solicitation to our mind reaction. If we look at black figure, we see the boats on the wine. If we look at red figure, we see the commas bringing uh, an amphora to the symposium. And so there are always at least two possibilities of uh, 
of shifting the focal, of looking at one or the other thing. The scale is different. The reference is different. We are on the sea, we are at the symposium, we are on the cup, we are at the banquet. And this is the pleasure of what this painter is doing, playing with allusions to uh, other spaces, other circumstances, and bringing the drinker in an in a imaginary world. This is the same on that very fragmentary cup, uh, unfortunately, but that cup is, is playing even more. Uh, as you see, it's uh, the tondo of a cup because the cup is even bigger. But uh, th so there is a zone which is not the whole cup. And the zone, of course, is, is filled with uh, banqueters, one playing music and the other uh, discussing. And at the very core of the cup, and there is a tondo with an altar and a, and a man making a libation. So two uses of the wine for the gods in the ritual of the libation and for the pleasure in the symposium. But there is another step. Uh, so this is the, the, <clears throat> the libation. But on the outside of the same cup, we have a group of, of drinkers it's fragmentary, unfortunately, but drinkers lying on couches on the ground. And what is usually a zone of ornament is here filled with vases, skifoi, cups, uh, oinokoi, cups, skifos, and so on, and, and the stick of the, one of the banqueters. So the object here is the actual object. This is a cup handled and used by a drinker. And this is a cup which is in a different technique. It's not even black figure. It's just silhouette, so very graphic and very ornamental. This is a, an object as what we've seen in the background, not handled, but also embedded in a row, which becomes a very ornamental row. And this is very clear on other cups. It's a kind of mode uh, around the early sixth century on which Daphne Williams has written a very interesting article. But what I'm trying to, to show you is this, the cup is used by the man, the Ainoko is used by the boy, and now the Ainoko is here and the cup is here. So these are ornaments and separated from the, the main scene, but echoing, of course, uh, all what is at stake in the symposium. Uh, also, this skifos is very interesting because it has one handle, but also a phallus. So it's playing with a, a bodily human anthropomorphic presence of the, the, the male sex on the vase used and thought of as a body. And I will stop here with this uh, problems of the frame and the, the circle, but I, I want to finish with Another aspect of the same problem. This is a cup by the antiphon painter, which shows you not, not even a whole bed. It shows you only the part of it. The other leg has to be thought as being here and the trapeza has to be completed. So you have to make a mental, uh, very simple effort to complete. You, you, only saw, you only see one part of more complex I think the bed and the, that bed isolated and, and, and zoomed in by the, the, by the tondo, that bed is only one part of a more complex image with all the, the beds as we had here or there, for example. So images can only focus and zoom in or out. And it's the same here. The, the problem of the tondo is that it's a circle. So the ground line can work only for a very tangential moment. Uh, and the painters have to cut the object. This is a stool, but it's cut. This is a laver, but it's, it's partly cut. The, the kalatos and the chair also. Mm -hmm. So you have to mentally complete the image. The same here for the altar and the same here for the crater. And it works because 
the fruit are on the ground and the ground is not perceived as a circle. When people are not moving, it's fine. And when they are moving, the movement is, is, is okay. I mean, not contradicted mentally by the actual circle instead of a ground line. Another aspect of this framing problem, of this framing, not, not a problem, in the, what, what you can do with the frame, is that you can frame also the invisible. Here, for example, we have uh, Heracles and Athena and the entrance of the Hades. We know that because Kerberos is the guardian of this entrance. So you don't see the invisible, the infernal world. It's out of your sight. And, and that line is, the, is really the, the border. You can't go there. The, the column shows the entrance and Heracles is playing with going in and out and taking Kerberos away from with the chain and taming the dog and, and trying to control that uh, entrance. Painters have also used the ground line as the limit of the underground. And uh, here we have Gay giving Eryctoneus to Athena. And that limit is just a line and nothing else. In other cases, like here, where you have uh, Persephone and probably Hecate and Hermes, Persephone coming out from the underworld and reappearing, here the painter has elaborated on that ground line and traced a, a sort of chasma gaze. I mean, the, the, the earth is opening and she's coming out of it and uh, appearing. So the underworld, the Hades, are not described, but the frame gives a limit and an access to that. And in a different way, we have the same problem, which is dealt by uh, white ground leketoi, funerary leketoi, bars painter. Uh, here, the Saburov painters is showing uh, the deceased led by Hermes uh, to Haran and to the boat which will cross and take him away. Uh, I have no picture and on the website of the uh, Met, you, you don't find more than that. But it's interesting when you look at, by the same painter, another Lekitos in Berlin. So Hermes is here, here is uh, Haran. So it's the same, almost the same image. But here I could take a picture of the back which is very interesting because you see the meander stops, the, the, the main picture stops and the boat is not even finished because it fades away in a zone which is a kind of Hades zone uh, with, with reeds and with a, an, an image which is, not, which is painted differently to introduce you to a different space and to the other, uh, other world. And, and this we have more systematically done by the so-called reed painter. The, the deceased is here, there are some reeds and she's going to the boat of Karen and the boat is not finished and the reeds are marking the limit of the image and the entrance to the Hades. So these formal problems of frame, backgrounds, seem to be only art historical uh, formalist problems, but I take them to be uh, extremely meaningful first, and also uh, giving us some evidence of what is expected by the painters from the ancient viewer. And uh, the same here, the same trick on a Lucanian, a very early Lucanian, uh, vast painter, the Dolom painter, showing us uh, Odysseus having sacrificed some rams to, uh, to uh, call up the, the deceased. It's the episode of the Necria. And in the Necria, the blood of the, of the rams uh, on the ground line brings up the invisible and the deceased. And here we have Tiresias, uh, dead and blind, 
as a seer speaking to, to sorry, speaking to Odysseus. And you see how the blood goes over the frame and the image has, shows more. I mean, you have one uh, ram here, another one here with a throat and uh, uh, Joe upright. And the, bl the blood is, is, is flowing here and, and Theresias is coming up and emerging from the ground and speaking to uh, Odysseus. So that problem of the frame is not just a, a formal problem. No, very briefly, because time is, is almost over, um, I think we could go further and trying to think about not just the surface and the frame, but the, the part itself. And I go very briefly. Um, when you look at the cap, most of these vases have several pictures on it, uh, outside and inside when it's a cap, or back and front, which is an amphora, or the belly and the, the shoulder when it's an hydria, and so on and so on. And this connection between the different pictures on the one part are open to many possibilities. And when you look at one side, you, of course, you start guessing um, what is he doing? I mean, this one is interesting because it, it's using the, the trick the Berlin painter invented of showing uh, of there are no palmets by the handles, just one figure seen from the back, the ground line is very minimal. And this is a satyr looking around and we look at him and we wonder what is on the other side, what is inside. And he's looking around also. And inside we have the same satyr jumping down onto a sleeping woman. So his object of desire is now made visible and appears here. And there are many, many tricks. I can't go into details. I've done that elsewhere and I don't want to be boring, but uh, just very simply, many of the uh, amphorae have two sides connected. This is by the Berlin painter. And here we have Zeus uh, using his sander. We don't know what's on the back and we cannot uh, know in advance. We have to turn the part. And now we find Ganymedes here. But it could be uh, on this one, again, the same Zeus, and now it's a giant. And here, the same Zeus, and now it's a woman, probably Aegina. So the allusion is, is built by the painter itself on the pot. He, he teases our mind, and he's making a proposal, and we have to react, and, and we check, and, and we we play and these objects are playful objects. The same here, I mean, on one side, we have this woman with an hydria at the fountain, the motif we've seen already. Now, if we go on the other side, it's now, it's, a, it's, it's an amphora and it's a satyr. And so it's shifting from water to wine, from uh, dignity to excitement and from uh, something which could be safe and and, and quiet, but the excitement of the satyr is not just about wine, of course. And so the, 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 the joke is here that you, you never know what is going to happen. Now, this is about one part and the various images on one part. If we start thinking about a set or a different part together, I just only uh, evoking the problem. I have no time to discuss it, but here we have two Lekithoi in the British Museum found together by the same painter from the same workshop. And the image on it is very interesting because you have a seated woman with a, a, a chest and on the other one, Eros bringing a chest. And the orientation of the of Eros towards the woman, the way they work, they really work like the two sides of one part but there are two parts made to go together. And it's, it's hard to speculate further because this is rather exceptional, but there are examples. And I would just finish with a much more complex problem. 
and I'm, I'm glad uh, Daphne is in the audience. He knows that better than I do. This is a group of vases which have ended up, most of them, in the British Museum. They come from Capua, and we call it the Brigo Stone because there is that cup by the Brigo's painter in it, and they go together. So it's a set of objects cut together, not by the painter and the potters, but by the people who decided to put all of them in one tomb. Uh, there is a big um, chronological difference between this cup by Brigos, which could be 490, or this uh, Skiffos by Macron, which could be a contemporary with Brigos. But these are, sorry, these are much later. They are by the Sotades painter, and these are by the council painter. They are one or two generations later. So clearly something different happened here. Uh, some people have kept these objects at home and then decide to put them in the tomb where we got them uh, in the 19th century. So it's a much, it's a very different kind of speculation I'm making here. And I will not go very far on it. Um, they've been put together by Beasley. Uh, they've been commented by Daffrey in, in a wonderful paper in the American Journal of Archaeology, thinking that this was a very Greek assemblage by people who knew their uh, mythology. And I draw your attention of all the wings we have here on the Sphinx, on the Eos for Swing Kephalos, and here again, and here on the Sphinx, but also on the winged seat of uh, Triptolemus. Also, of course, the, the, the combination of animals, of um, mixed niche vessel, as the Germans say, so of the Sphinx, but also of here, of uh, Erecteus. So there are, I, I, I will not go into details, there are lots of uh, elements which help to connect this vase. Also the repetition, I mean, this vase is very close to that one and this one to that one. So really building a system for that occasion. It's not given by the painter or the potter, it's really something that is constructed by the people at the time of Berry. Who are these people? I definitely thought they were very Greek people. I look at Julian, you think they are very, and, and Juliette de la Genere, very companion people, and I'm not going to open that discussion. I will turn back to, the, to, to conclude to one of the cup, the Brigos painter's cup, uh, in, that, uh, in that tomb and back to, to, to Athens. Um, what I'm trying to show is that there is a, a, a very important uh, system of allusion in this uh, vase, Attic vase painting of the fifth, sixth and early fifth century. Uh, objects are very often combined like here in the system of the fiale and the, 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 the latter to take wine and make a libation. Also here, the shield, which is given to the warrior. I mean, the woman is arming the warrior and preparing a libation for departure. And there is an interesting connection between shield and fiale as we saw in, in the lectures I gave some years ago. But my point today is to uh, draw your attention to the, uh, what is expected by the painter from the viewer of the pots in Athenian culture. It's very elusive, it's very fragmentary, it's very paratactic. Uh, they don't give you the whole description of everything. They don't give you all the detail of the mechanism of the story. It's, it's very elusive. And in a way, I think it's, it works in the same way as lyric poetry at the symposium works. Uh, the, the poets are not telling in detail long stories. They are just dropping names, giving one illusion, and it's enough for the educated uh, symposiums to understand what is going on. And so I think I've been uh, long enough 
one hour. Thank you for your patience and for your attention. And I, I wish we could have a drink now together and a good discussion, but maybe uh, we can do that by, by mail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francois. Yes, I wish we could have a drink. It's only noon in California, but you know, I would still, I would still do that. You keep that for next time. <laughs> yeah, I'm really so grateful to you for for giving us this lecture, and I have to say, it is such an incredible pleasure to look at things with you. I mean, so thank you, and not only because I see things that I just can't see at all otherwise, but because you give us really new ways of looking i'm not going to go on because it's well, not fair but well. you know because just because i have the floor i'm not going to but but i i do love this way of thinking about all the resources of pots you know all objects and frames and just seeing how much they do you know how much they can be activated but anyway you have received a few questions through the chat function and what we are going to do is pass those to you later and you can respond to them uh, through email offline because it's just too cumbersome on Zoom. Yeah, it could be, yeah. but, but thank you for all these reactions and yeah. thank you for your patience. I mean, uh, I, I'm a great fan of these spots, of course, and I love right. them. And I'm not the only one, and I've yeah. learned a lot from uh, Daffy and some others. So, yeah. so thank you for all of you, and yeah, I hope we keep on. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks to everyone who joined us. And I, I can't let everyone go without just reminding you that we have another lecture coming up, our second lecture on, it's February 27th, and that will be Mary Beard. And all the information is on our website. Anyway, thank you so much, Francois. Thank you so much, invisible audience. Uh, and uh, hope to welcome you back again in a few weeks for Mary Beard. So. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.